Okay, <clears throat> and I'm back. <laughs> All right, so I just did this whole thing about this uh, machine learning stuff, except that the except that the stream software was the uh, recording software was on the broadcast software was on the wrong was on the wrong setting, and so none of this was recorded, uh, or the audio was recorded. You know, I'll just make a, another dub. Anyways, uh, my point is check out this article about. Google brings generative AI to cybersecurity. Note that they are addressing two, uh, two subtopics of uh, generative of AI and cybersecurity, neither of which are the ones that are actually interesting. What is actually interesting with regards to uh, machine learning and cybersecurity is poisoning attacks on machine learning, also known as adversarial machine learning, which is something you should look into. So again, just go do some Re, uh, research on adversarial machine learning, and uh, I don't know. I guess maybe I'll put these. I'll put these visuals back on. I'll do. I'll fix all of that in post. The other thing I, the other thing I wanted to mention was this book that I mentioned yesterday, "Hacking APIs." Um, that is a uh, uh, breaking web application uh, programming interfaces. This is the book that I was. Uh, reading from or mentioning a little bit yesterday by Corey Ball, apparently an actual real name. And uh, so here it is, neostarch.com uh, is where you can find it. All right, so, so much of that. Uh, that was weird. Um, all right, since uh, they, there's not this introduction, I'll go through this introduction again. This top two, this is the cybersecurity starter kit. Um, I know it says kit. That sounds like there's components. There isn't. It's just me talking, although I will point you to the components, stuffs that you need, that you will need uh, if you want to become a real professional party peoples. Uh, in the previous episode, we covered these top two items right here, which was about uh, to get used to looking under the covers of things. It's going to be very complicated and impenetrable at times. That's normal. Uh, get used to that feeling and, uh, and you'll fit right in. A lot of it you won't understand yet. That's normal. Uh, don't don't uh, freak out, and, and don't you know like do the OCD nerd thing of needing to understand absolutely all of it all the time, because uh, then you won't sleep for uh, like twenty years, like me. Don't don't do that. Uh, so it will come in time. Uh, just make sure you still have a life as well. Uh, these there are some, as I mentioned in the previous episode, there are still core technologies that you do still need to know, although not quite as much as uh, as you used to need to know them, but you will still need to know them and the reasons why will become evident in time. Some of that was demonstrated in yesterday's episode and more of that will be demonstrated today. We also talked about uh, HTML and JavaScript and a little bit about APIs. I did talk a little tiny bit about, um, you know, TCP IP stuff, networking stuff that is important that you will still need to know about. And that will be I, well, probably, yeah, I guess this will be where we start uh, today for this um, for this episode. And I'm going to try and say um less. And I have changed out the microphone, which I think this one probably sounds better. So apologies to anyone who sat through the previous episode. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, I, I actually have talked a lot about Chrome DevTools already, and we're going to spend even more time with it. I mentioned on the aborted previous take of this uh, of this video uh, that, you, that it's, it's best if you get as much mileage out of the tools that are readily available as, uh, as you can. Okay. Uh, at all times, this is, I, I'm not, the reason I am not even press it, prefacing this with, in my opinion or anything like that is because this is such time honored wisdom that I feel comfortable. It applies, uh, at all times. So, you know, that is to say, you know, like, this is why I mentioned in the, in the afforded take of this, um, I mentioned like this is this is why people still, uh, you know, recommend uh, recommend that you learn by. Okay, uh, yes, it's ugly. There's like it's it's actually quite powerful once you learn how to use it. But the point is, it's going to be on every single Unix flavored system that you ever encounter. If it has but one editor, it will have Vi. So it behooves you to know how to use those things, which will. Uh, which are most likely to be available, and to that, uh, to that, uh, to, to wit, um, Chrome DevTools is like always going to be available. And also, on the other browsers, you usually have some equivalent. And um, so, 
And you get a tremendous amount of mileage out of this, as I said before. Uh, you know, as I, I mentioned this on the previous episode, but you can get very far into an engagement or into recon or into checking out, you know, triaging some suspected vulnerability or something like that that you're working with. You can get very, very deep into that process uh, just with Chrome tools and nothing else. That is that is plenty. And uh, so, yeah, you should master this first, you know, before you, you know, look into stuff like Burp and all that kind of stuff. And, and these also are, you know, like the interoperate. Uh, uh, okay, like I was showing you yesterday these requests um, that, you know, we have the opportunity to really inspect and understand using these, uh, these sorts of tools here, down here. Another thing you can do is like, see I'm, I'm right clicking on one of these right here. Uh, you can, let's see, uh, I chose this copy option right here and there's a bunch of copy as options, right? Pardon me. You can copy it as a PowerShell uh, copy it as uh, HAR, copy it as Node.js, uh, copy it as uh, as curl command, right? And so the in, to, to replicate this request, they were looking at it and we're like, hmm, this thing is interesting. I want to look more closely at it. Um, you can just copy the curl syntax right out of it and it will compose it for you, uh, even be this a uh, a fairly complex request. I mean, this would have been a pain in the butt to put together to look at all these headers. Sorry, I'm getting ahead. You don't know what any of this means yet. <laughs> That's all right. And the, the point is, this is all built in. Like, all of this is free. So I don't want to hear anybody whining about tools uh, uh, until they have maxed out what they can do with, uh, uh, with what's already available with Chrome DevTools, for instance. All right. So uh, where was the agenda here? So Chrome DevTools we'll talk about, although fancier tools uh, can be nice too. So we'll talk about those as well. And WSL or Linux, um, yeah, get to that. And some more about hacker culture. And I'm really kind of bummed because as I said, there was an aborted first take of this video in which I went on this, I thought pretty cool rant about this uh, open AI uh, or not open AI, about this uh, TechCrunch article and at how it relates to uh, adversarial machine learning. But I, I don't know, we might get back to that later. Uh, so that's it. Exercise for the reader, go look into that stuff, it's important. And it is, in my opinion, the, uh, the future, um, you know, the future attack surface. If you're, I think the future cybersecurity and uh, people, future hackers, that's what they're gonna be hacking, okay? They're not gonna be hacking these web applications. Uh, um, I mean, they might, I think they might have tools that are doing the hacking for them. I don't know. But uh, adversarial machine learning is where it's really going to be at because that's where the big uh, form of the big uh, losses and the big payoffs will be, depending upon what color hat you wear. Um, okay, so that's it. We're catching up here from, resuming here from the uh, lower down. We talked a little bit about APIs in the previous episode. Uh, refer to that. Oh, also I, I mentioned on there that uh, I mentioned on the previous uh, aborted take uh, that if you're watching this on Twitch, you uh, go can, can go to YouTube actually for uh, go to uh, youtube.com uh, slash unhacker uh, for the replays of this. And if you're on YouTube, you will note that you don't see these live streams. That's because I recorded on uh, Twitch for my convenience. It just works better. There's a bunch of things. We were talking about tools, and so uh, I wanted to point out that in the previous episode, we spent a little time with Talent API Tester. There are many other similar tools like Postman and stuff like that. This is the one I like to use just because it's it's pretty much all I need most of the time. I don't need to go too far. If it goes much further than what this can do, I usually um, have have bumped out to something like Burp or some you know uh, shells uh, shell scripts. <laughs> Actually, get an awful lot done with that. So, lower down. All right. Yesterday I talked about RFCs and we were talking about RFC um, 26, what is it, 2616? Um, let's see, uh, 2616, which is the one we were reading yesterday. It's about uh, HTTP, right? So, and HTTP is how 
this data. You can, right now, just, I mean, it's hypertext transfer protocol. That's not the important part, though. Um, the important part is, you know, how you are to think about it. Here we go. So this 2616, this is the, uh, it, it's been um, deprecated already, uh, obviously, since it was published in 1999. <clears throat> this is the hypertext uh, transfer protocol, i.e. HTTP from 1999. And it describes, as I was discussing yesterday, the I was going to call it platonic ideal of how this should work. I, and I think that's a good phrase, but, but in this case, it's, I mean, it's a technical specification specification for how it works. Right. I mean, like, uh, so those that are a little familiar with what's going on, uh, in this discussion, uh, might have heard the phrase get before this is a type of HTTP transaction. And, uh, that is, def that's behave the behavior of that, uh, of that HTTP verb, that's what they're also called, or a method. The behavior of that method is defined herein, right? So this is where, uh, I'm, I'm guessing going back on this rant again, but this is where the behavior of that is defined. You get it? So if, you know, and, and look, I mean, it's only a couple of paragraphs. Obviously, there's other materials that relate to how this works. But the point is, <clears throat> if you are, you know, if you are working with post, which is another one of the HTTP verbs, another method. If you're working with something with post, it, it behooves you. I sure do like that word, don't I? Uh, it behooves you to really understand uh, what the intent was when it was designed. All right. So again, remember like on the previous video, I was talking about a bank vault and, you know, I was like, they're, they're you know, discussions of bank vaults discuss how they're supposed to work, right? And that's what that's what this is. This is describing how it, you know, how they meant for it to work. And also, a lot of times, it's it's really useful for understanding, you know, why, like why it was designed that way. Um, why are there uh, uh, limitations on a length of something like that, right? Or what is the limitation on a length of something? Um, you know, like we just. Uh, Let's see. All right, so I just placed one. Well, that was weird. All right, so there's a request to HT or to uh, HTTPS YouTube at YouTube.com. So that was YouTube YouTube.com. Um, this part right here. So what happened was my machine. And this is where we're going to get into TCP IP uh, eventually. So briefly, all right, my machine connected to servers at youtube.com at a very high level. I'm glossing over some of that. This, it's actually cloud stuff, but my machine connected to is servers at youtube.com. All right. Over session, such a port, you will learn later. And it accessed a, I'm using air quotes here, accessed a file called unhacker. Okay. Back in the day, these used to actually be files. Nowadays, it's not, it's, you know, instead the server on YouTube is interpreting the request for this file as meaning to fetch uh, other resources in this case, my webpage or my uh, YouTube channel. Okay. Um, you know, like when we're requesting this file right here, right? So I'm requesting a file named unhacker. Um, I, I, I bet you could probably request a file called Crash Course, right? Uh, one of my favorite YouTube channels. Um, these are different, right? Um, look, the Crash Course is longer than Unhacker, right? So, I mean, I wonder, like, how long could this be? You know, could, is, like, how long could the name of this file be? Could it just be, like, super long? By the way, they, they rejected that request. <laughs> Um, wonder, let's see why they, they have certainly have no obligation to provide me with a, with us with an answer as to why. Uh, well, they said 404, which might as well be just that channel doesn't exist. Actually, now I'm curious. So what I do, if I want to know whether or not this, like right now I'm checking a YouTube channel. So if I want to know whether or not this exists and say, if I put underscore one, that doesn't mean that there's not a channel called crash course underscore one, right? So instead I'll put like a really unlikely number. It's unlikely someone else would have used that same number. 
and you get a 404. So that's probably what a 404, or what they send you back when the channel doesn't matter. And the length of this uh, did not necessarily offend them, right? So, so now you're wondering, like, if YouTube doesn't have a problem with how long this thing is, like, is, is there a limit? What is the upper limit on how, on how long this thing could be? You, you know why I'm, you know why I'm asking this, right? Because that limitation, if it exists, is going to be specified in this document, okay, and not just the specification. Okay, there's a thing here called content link. Um, uh, content link. The content link entity header field indicates the size of, actually this is for a response, the size of an entity body and such and such a number, and then they give you the math for calculating it. Applications should use this field to indicate the should. Look, and see, this is important. It's in uppercase, right? Applications should use this field to indicate the transfer length of a message body, unless uh, some uh, minutia, minutia, unless minutia rules. Um, the point is, this is important. Actually, yeah, this is the most important part of this little paragraph right here. It's the fact that this says should, right? So this means that not all applications use this field to indicate the transfer length of the message body, okay? There may be applications that don't do this. And if you uh, maybe write an application that makes some assumptions about this content length and what it's being used for, you are making a mistake. Okay, you're making a mistake that may one day be that may one day express itself as a bug, which will be used by a hacker. Right? This is exactly the kind of stuff that becomes that becomes vulnerabilities. Usually, is where like maybe where it says should. <clears throat> I'll tell you a scenario I've seen a billion times, and as I mentioned, I've been doing this for 20 years. So, a scenario I've seen a billion times is that like 99.99% of the developers uh, that write applications that use this, the, the, you know, that use the techniques that are defined in this document, 99% of them um, interpret this should to be like, oh, I'm not going to use it for that, right? So like most people don't use it or sometimes the opposite situation. 99% of them do do it, right? And so everybody's built their systems under the assumption that everybody is doing it. But, but they don't have to, and so systems don't enforce it. And that disparity is what leads to the, you know, a variable, variable computational effects that end up becoming hacking, right? When things behave in different ways, uh, unexpected ways. So there's lots of shoulds and stuff like that in here. And I think there's also a limit, there's definitely a limitation on a URL. Obviously it's faster now to simply Google uh, 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 a byte limitation on URL. There's probably an easier way to phrase that, Gary. See, look, look, see, this is why hackers still exist. This is why cybersecurity will always be a problem. <laughs> this is why vulnerabilities will always be a problem. What do you mean it is generally accepted? That's not good enough. Generally accepted uh, not to exceed 255. You know, as older implementations may not be able to handle it, what is the real, actually it probably is, I never go to Stack Overflow. Um, okay, it's probably 2048, that sounds more reasonable. Um, let me think, I mean, we have to look at the HTTP, we really have to look at the HTTP standard. All right, so I talked a little bit, am I on the right topic area? Yeah, we're on TCP IP and lower down, lower level stuff. Um, all right. So, I mean, I showed you this. Uh, Mr. Trees mean crash courses uh, YouTube channel, right? That's what that looks like. What exactly is happening there? What is defined in the uh, HTTP um, RFC? Uh, I mean, should we read through some of that? I don't know. Then I, this whole thing will take forever. Um, I'm just wondering if there's like a super high level, but at this point, you know, there are, as I said, this is not where you would go to learn it. What I'm trying to express to you is the, is the importance of understanding why things were designed that the, the way that they were. If there's, as I said in the previous video, if there are other ways that you get this, then, then please feel free to do so. 
you know, I mean, like these diagrams look pretty, look pretty good to me, but I'm, as I said, I'm old school, so this, this looks normal to me. All right, let's get to the, um, let's look at the Wikipedia article. I'm pretty sure there's gotta be like some pretty graphs and charts or diagrams, diagrams of things talking back and forth. Uh, no, it's actually quite technical. All right, we'll just dive right in then. All right. This, what you're seeing on the screen right here, right? This request for youtube.com slash crash course. I just said it right now. It's, I called it a request. That's what we call this. This is an HTTP request. Again, remember the stuff I was saying about user land versus nerd land. Um, this, you know, like to, to users, this is a URL or a website or an address or something like that, right? Okay. That's not what this is to you. That's just the interface. You know, as I said, that would be like, as I said yesterday, that's like confusing the, the car for the, or confusing the steering wheel for the car, like thinking that the steering wheel is the car because that's how you control the car is through the steering wheel. But I dare you to try driving down the street with just the steering wheel. So, uh, I mean, if anything is to be argued to be the car, it's, it's not the steering wheel. So that is, it's a similar situ right, situation here, right here. You are seeing a website or a URL or a location, whatever users want to call it. Uh, to us, this is a request, right? So when I put this in here and I press enter, the same thing is happening as when we do this. Okay, this is just a really low level. I'm using air quotes around low level. And you'll become familiar with that terminology, meaning that it is operating closer to the metal, so to speak. Um, this is just a low level you know, HTTP client. I was going to call it a web browser, but it's not a web browser. Um, so this is a low level curl as a low level HTTP client that you can get for Linux. And I don't know, maybe it runs on other platforms too. And you'll get it in the course of this uh, whole uh, bootcamp thing. Um, this is, this browser right here is an HTTP client. That's, that's what it does. It's an HTTP client and it renders HTML and runs JavaScript. It does a bunch of other crap, right? It's a rather complex, it's an extremely complex piece of software actually, but at its core, it is an HTTP client, right? And it talks to an HTTP server over at yahoo.com. This is curl is also an HTTP client. Um, do I have Telnet on now? Yeah, I do. Uh, Telnet is also an HTTP an HTTP client. Um, I, I probably can't do this, actually. It's been a real fucking long time. Okay, there we go. Yeah, all right, eh, good enough. I didn't really do the, the preface like yours, the, the preamble. Uh, but anyways, uh, okay, so even that is a, this is another way to retrieve youtube.com. Not a very good way. It'd be darn hard to try and navigate youtube.com this way. Uh, but that is another way to do that, right? And all that is actually doing is just connecting to youtube.com on, I'm going to introduce a new term now, on port 80, right? And it says 80 right here, right? Because that's where I'm connecting. Uh, it's, we'll talk about that later, but let's just say like there's a different slot. There's a bunch of different slots or, or phone lines that you might talk to youtube.com and this is on port 80, so... <clears throat> This is just connecting my machine to youtube.com, one of the machines that answered under the name of youtube.com somewhere in their massive data center, connected to them on port 80. And I said, give me, give me your, your website. This is how you say, give me your website uh, in, HT, in HTTP, right? See, this is, this is the conversation that happened that led to YouTube sending, well, actually just this part, is the conversa conversation that happened uh, that led to YouTube sending me back all of this stuff, which we will all get into at some point, um, followed by all of the youtube.com uh, you know, front page, actually. I'm assuming that's what this is. Uh, oh yeah, actually I recognize this from yesterday when we were looking at the youtube.com front page. So yeah, that is the youtube.com front page. Obviously not an optimal way to view the internet, uh, <clears throat> it really makes Steam a lot less interesting. Um, so, anyways, what exactly does all of that mean? I just said that 
we connected my machine to that machine, and then there's something about port 80. Well, what is all of this crap anyways? I talked about IP addresses yesterday, but for the moment, they're not really relevant to this, but what, before it connects to youtube.com, it's, it's getting YouTube's uh, IP address, as I said, the address, which is much like your house address. Um, so it got that first because it can really only talk to that. It can't, it can't, it needs an address before it does that. And that's where the DNS stuff comes in. Um, what's the best way for me to demonstrate this? What does that mean that they connected to each other? Well, uh, meet my uh, little friend, uh, TCP. Uh, RFC 793, is that the good one to look at? 5681, oh, that's congestion control specifically. Oh, that's really lovely. Um, this, will this do? All right, this will do. All right, so RFC 9293, one of the uh, suite of RFCs that defined TCP, which is the Transmission Control Protocol. And uh, you'll note that in my notes, it says TCP IP. That's because those two are used together and we'll get into the IP later. But for right now, you don't have to worry about it. And from a hacker's perspective, frankly, 99.99% of the time, unless you are actually trying to take over like entire networks or poison the entire world's uh, routing, you're probably going to spend most of your time concerned with transmission with TCP and not so much with IP. Okay. Uh, but you do need to know how they work together. So as I was talking about before with RFC 2616, this is a document that defines how this uh, should work. Okay. So if you're, you know, you got a bunch of egg heads in a room, they get together. They're like, Hey, if we wanted to do this thing that uh, Gary was just talking about, yes, that's my real name, by the way. Uh, if we wanted to do this thing that Gary was just talking about machines talking to each other at some point in the distant future, I mean, it was 1999, right? Um, how would we go about doing that? And all these eggheads get together in a room and they write this massively huge document. How many pages is this? It's not that big, actually. It's only 200 pages. Quit whining. Um, so, and they sit down and they define a, uh, a way that this would work, right? Uh, and they, as I showed you before, they defined the, the methods that you'll learn about later and they, if there, if there is a document that says the maximum length of something with regards to HTTP, it's going to be in here, or it's going to be inspired or guided by, you know, by guidance that's been written in here and part of the original design. Um, and that is what this is for, for TCP as well. I still think these are really important documents. Yeah, you can get a tutorial on this stuff, but you're not going to get the insight into <clears throat> Uh, into why things are. It's just like the why question. I think the why question, just the mindset of wanting to understand why something is the way that it is, <clears throat> pardon me again, is, uh, is, is I really think it's central to the hacker mindset because I have, I mean, I, as I said, I've been doing this for a really long time and I've worked with technologists in who are experts in their own fields, like say, you know, database people or systems people or programmers and worked, you know, very closely with them on say, fixing vulnerabilities or designing secure systems. And sometimes we will be looking exactly at the exact same thing and they're just not even seeing it. It's kind of, it, it's kind of like, you know, if you, if you're bad with, uh, with engines, which I am, and you know someone's trying to point you actually at a point a, por a part in the engine, but you can't even see it even though they're pointing you directly at it because it's all just a big noisy mess to, to you know to you and you don't really see where you, you can't distinguish you can't resolve the details and what their relevance is right. Um, anyways, when you're thinking about TCP. Um, and you're thinking about HTTP and you're thinking about HTML and you're thinking about JavaScript and you're trying to put your understanding of these technologies together in order to mount an attack or in order to envision what an attacker would mount so that you can proactively defend against it. <clears throat> Pardon me. Then you need to understand why things are the way that they are um, so that you can 
you can figure out where, you know, something might be shimmed in or where an assumption might be made because everybody thinks that they're using, you know, a certain byte limit, but they're not all using a certain byte limit. And because you understand the background <clears throat> and the, the origin story for these, uh, you know, for this stuff, then, you know, you'll have the insight that says, well, no, that doesn't actually always work that way. So that thing you're looking at doesn't always mean what you think it, it means, right? So you, you need the backstory. All right, enough about that. That's more about hacker mindset. So TCP, you need to understand TCP like you understand, uh, you know, your own footprints, okay? Like you recognize your own footprints. I'm not kidding here. And this right here, this diagram, um, you need to be able to walk up to an empty whiteboard and reproduce this diagram uh, bit for bit and describe what every bit in this uh, format does. Ultimately, okay, that's what you need to do. So take this and tattoo it on your inner arm. I don't have any tattoos, but I, I can do what I just said. I can replicate this from scratch at any time um, because it is so, it's, it has become so uh, integral to, you know, the way I think about things and how I understand what's going on. <clears throat> Pardon me. How I understand what's going on uh, on the network. I'll give you an example. I, I mean, what are we looking at? I haven't even described what this is. You know what, for now, let me just introduce it right there. And, and um, it's the thing is like, it's weird when you've been doing something so long, because Maybe I, you know, it might be more difficult for me to see the parts that are not, are not self-evident, right? So to me, a lot of this stuff looks self-evident. So this is a diagram about, this is a diagram about bits, right? And bits, you know, can be zero or one. We already know about that. I'm assuming, we're assuming that you already have like basic computer science knowledge for this. So this is a, a diagram about bits, right? And it goes from the left to the right. Uh, this would be this right here. Actually, maybe this diagram isn't so awesome. Yeah, it is. That's kind of cool. Look, so that literally represents one bit in this entire gram, diagram. This is the TCP IP diagram. Uh, uh, actually, this is technically referred to as the TCP IP uh, header datagram or datagram header. It's TCP IP oh, datagram header. Right. Okay. So this little highlighted part up here, this uh, upper left, uh, this is the, the first bit in this diagram, which is about bits. It's a whole bunch of bits and it reads left to right. So you can think of them as being, you know, like stacked uh, next to and or on top of each other. I mean, in truth, they all just run from left to right, period, in a flat, straight line. In fact, they might not even be left to right. They might be right to left, depending upon how people like to eat their eggs. That's a deep cut. <laughs> If you get that joke, you're really cool. So, uh, but anyways, this diagram is sufficient at, at this level. It's fine to understand it in this manner. Now, the reason this says this says zero instead of one, because you're like, oh, if this is the first bit, why doesn't it start at one? Uh, well, refer to what I previously said about the basic computer science knowledge. So pretty much computers, they start counting at zero, not one. Uh, uh, not like people. So, because zero is a count, is a, a value. So anyways, so this is the, what we call the zeroth bit, which is a word that only exists in computer science. So the zeroth bit right here, um, and this is the once bit, right? This is the second uh, bit, which is actually the third bit, but this is bit number two, right? So bit number zero, bit number one, bit number two. You're thinking, wow, this is gonna take forever if we've only gotten three bits so far. That's okay, we're gonna speed up now. So all of this right here, right represents 16 bits and how i know this has a weird way of numbering this so this says zeros right here but you can see that this is 10 if you read like see vertically right so this is bit number 10 or as we've established the 11th bit but this would be bit number 10. Um, and then this is bit number 11 this bit number 12 and this is bit number 15. but again as we established there is a zeroth bit so this is 16 bits, uh, a term that you might've heard before, right? 16 bits is a convenient arrangement of bits and it comes up in computer science all the time. Anyways, uh, remember that I mentioned, 
Uh, I mentioned in this obscure command right here that we were connecting to youtube.com via this very simple. I'm going to tell you now that Telnet is a TCP client. In fact, uh, it's going to say uh, the Telnet command is used for interactive with another. Host. It didn't, actually doesn't say. How about this? If I do, I'll tell you about another TCP client. Here we go. This is an arbitrary TCP uh, connections and listens, right? So this is another TCP client. It's called NC. In uh, in Unix land, we love like uh, obscure cryptic command names that are just two letters. Uh, but we'll get to NC later. You're gonna have lots of fun with it someday. Not today. Um, actually, yeah, maybe today. We probably will play with it today now that I think about it. So. <clears throat> I told you that we were connecting to YouTube.com with Telnet, which is, as I said, a very simplistic TCP client, generally specific to a particular protocol. But uh, and we're connecting to it on port 80, right? Uh, and I kind of glossed over that bit. What am I talking about? Port yada yada. Um, well, look in the TCP header diagram, which I know you are currently tattooing on your forearm so that you can memorize it. <clears throat> and then replicate it at will in your head whenever you need it. In the TCP diagram, you'll notice that there are two fields here referring to ports. There is a source port and a destination port, right? Uh, and yeah, you can refer to this as a field. Um, so, and you'll note, uh, just visually, you'll note that since this whole diagram is split down the middle, this is a, a good way to remember it, by the way. The first thing you do is split the whole diagram down the middle until you get to options. But split the whole diagram down the middle uh, except for the sequence number and acknowledgement number. I'm glossing over it. All right. So there are two port fields and they're both 16 bits, right? Um, and you would think like, remember I was showing you that thing about, oh, like how long can this thing be? And we just kept making it longer and longer. And then that led, led to the discussion of how long something could be, how that would be defined in, in, in the RFC. Um, uh, so, so too, the, the similar question should, uh, should come to mind about this port thing, right? So you're like, oh, well, Gary said we're connecting to port 80. Uh, I wonder what happens if we connect to port, you know, like 8,000. Can we connect to port 8 million? Like how, how big does this go? How, how small does it go? You know, like what are the boundaries of it, right? This is how hackers think. Um, and so you might be wondering what the boundaries are of that. So this is the, this is actually called the destination port, uh, is, is what we call that. So we're connecting to youtube.com on destination port 80 with TC, with this low level TCP client called Telnet. And we're connecting to port 80. Um, how big do you think that number could be if we started futzing with it and we just started messing around, which wouldn't be very fruitful by the way, probably. Um, but well, it's, uh, this is where it gets stored, okay? If you're wondering where it goes in this TCP uh, transaction, this transmission between two computer systems, um, which is like a little tiny phone call, and we're gonna demonstrate some more of that. So you'll, you will get a deeper understanding of what's really happening here. I don't you know, want you to think it's always gonna be kind of abstract, right? We're just talking about this TCP. What does this even mean? How do these systems literally communicate? Uh, and you can see all of that. And you will at some point. Um, so what that means is that uh, is that this, you know, this whole bit, this TCP datagram uh, format, this is how the data is transferred from my mission. I have it, my requests are sent to YouTube.com and how YouTube sends the answers back. This is very high level abstraction of it, but um, but it, you, it transfers that data back and forth using this format, right? Using bits uh, laid out in this manner as we've previously described. And when it does that, it puts the destination port right here. This is where those bits go. And I know that <clears throat> I did say that, you know, basic computer science understanding would be necessary for this. So you should know how bits work and have some basic idea of how numbers are, are composed with it. So, but this is where the destination port value lives. So at a minimum, what you can infer that is that if we were doing this, we were going to port zero, which, you know, like don't do that and it won't work anyways. Actually, let's try it. Yeah, it doesn't work, but that's another point. If we were going to point zero, port zero, then all of these bits would be zero. That much you would know. You don't even have to be very good at binary arithmetic yet. 
but you will be someday. But you don't have to be very good at it yet to know that if this value was zero, then all of these bits would be zero. Okay, that, that's it. And if it, if it were one, then all of these bits would be zero, except for the very last one right here would be one. So that would look like eight, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's what that would look like, okay? Um, right? Just this is 16 bits right here. I mean, except for the space. I put the space in for convenience so it's easier to read. So here are 16 bits. There are imagined 16 bits, a visualization of 16 bits um, with a value of one, right? So, and again, the, if it were all zeros, that would be that would be zero, okay? That's a value of zero, obviously. I mean, I know a lot of this seems really rhetorical, but we're trying to establish, you know, basic a foundational understanding, right? So this is zero, this is one, and I will leave it as an exercise to the reader to, uh, to understand how to get from here to two and three and all that kind of stuff. So learn your binary arithmetic, that's what you're gonna wanna, um, and you will need to become familiar with that um, at some point, but not immediately. The, but for our purposes, this is great for demonstrating <clears throat> why an understanding of these fundamentals is so important. As I said before, these two fields, these source and destination port fields are 16 bits, right? Um, and we were asking how big this number could be. And so like a very curious novice should ask, they should be cake. And I put in 800 million, which is not a stupid question. It's a good question if you're new, right? <clears throat> but there is a limitation on this value. And the limitation is defined by the maximum value that you could fit into this field, right? And as I said before, uh, like say, if this were a one bit, if this were a one bit field, say if this diagram looked very different and all of this was something else and only this one bit right here was the destination port, then that would allow you to have, think about it, you can do this right now. What are the possible port values that you could use if the destination port was only one, one bit? Well, you could have zero in that bit, right? Or you could have one in that bit and that's it. There's, there are no other possibilities. So that means the total range of possible ports to which you could connect to u2.com would be two. There would be two, a total of two possible ports. You could connect to port zero and you could connect to port one. That is if the destination field were but one bit instead of 16 bits as it, as it truly is. But it's 16 bits. So now we have the numbers that we would need in order to calculate what, how big this number could be, right? Well, actually there is math for this. You just uh, take the number of possible values, which is two, because it's, it's two raised to the uh, two bits, it's zero and one, so two possible values. So you take the number of possible values and you raise it to the power, how do you do that in this calculator? I usually do uh, times times, uh, hold on, I'll just do it. Let's do it here. So you take the number of possible values. There are two possible values, zero and one, right? And you raise it to the number of possible positions, so the length of the field. And so if the length of the field oops, is 16, you get two raised to the 16th power, which happens to be 65,536. So there are, but it's really better if we actually show that. Oh, no, that's two times 16. I don't actually know how to use the Windows calculator. <laughs> uh, it's actually easier for me to, for me to do this. Um, well, just print a two raised to the 16th power, uh, which is, oh, wait, that's two, that's two plus 18? Hold on, I got that wrong. I don't know how I did, actually, it's been a while since I've used this uh, for that. So, uh, oh, you know what? It is times times, now that I think about it. It's two, two raised to the 16th power is two times times 16. So uh, 65,536. 65,536 possible values, remember, starting at zero. So that means the maximum value, the highest number that this could be, is 65,535. And there's your answer, right? So 
And this is just not an arbitrary question that you're going to have to answer one time because you're often going to end up uh, trying to figure out yeah, how big something is permitted to be and what would be just over the limit of that and what would be excessively over the limit of that. Um, <clears throat> so that's actually more an advertisement for understanding binary arithmetic actually than anything else. But so, by the way, that's not going to help. They don't have anything listening. You'll understand that terminology later. They're not expecting any connections on 465,535. And I'm curious though, what happens if I go beyond that? What if it's 65,536? I'm expecting some sort of error. Yeah, there you go. See, Telnet won't, <clears throat> Telnet, the low level TCP client, pardon me. <clears throat> Telnet, the low, low level TCP client will not even connect to that because it knows that it cannot compose the TCP packet that is necessary to begin that that uh, conversation, right? It would have to put more bits in this than a higher number in the destination port than uh, is available in that field. Um, as a matter of fact, if we, let's see, we'll do, let's do this. All right, so there's some google.com action and a lot of this will not make sense yet, but, oh, I don't have that. That's weird. This will do because they have it on Windows too. All right, so you don't know this command yet. I'm using the net stack command. It's just a very simple way to show us the state of TCP ports and other ports. We'll get to that more later. Uh, to show us the state of ports on our machine. Uh, the same command and many similar commands exist in other operating systems as well. And this can be a, very illuminating. I recommend you try it on your own machine and look at what's going on. You will find, you should find it very interesting uh, now that you're learning about TCP, which you will see is, uh, figures prominently on the left-hand side of this display. Uh, so this shows where there are active TCP connections between our machine and these other ones are not connections between our machine, but we can get to those later. You, you note that a short time ago, I just said that YouTube was not listening. They were not listening on port 65535 and they were not expecting any connections from there. See, so uh, TCP is, is apparently something you can be listening on and um, my machine is listening and so is your machine. Is listening. Everybody's listening. Um, and then it can be established too. This is good. Uh, we're going to come back to this, right? So this says that actually these are bad examples that I'm using. These are what they call local sockets. Um, all right, here's some more. <clears throat> so we uh, see connections between uh, TCP connections between this left hand side, which is my machine, to a bunch of other machines, right? Remember, I was talking about IP addresses yesterday. Uh, these are all different addresses of different stuff. I don't know what they are. There's stuff that we've been using right now. I bet you this is YouTube, actually, or uh, Google, because I recognize that IP uh, space from, let's see. Oh, it's Amazon. Uh, you will also learn how to do what I just did, which is to attribute that, uh, the ownership of that address to Amazon. So <clears throat> anyways, okay, so here's connections between my machine and many, many, many other machines. Um, you can see these ones are established. Some of these other ones I was talking about before are listening sockets. Sockets, that's a new term. Let's just say they're just listening. It's TCP listening. These other ones are established because these connections are, for the moment, let's gloss over it a bit and say that these are ongoing current conversations that are taking place between the machines. In truth, that's not completely accurate because this entire protocol is supposed to be stateless, but that's, it's good enough for now for you to just think of these as ongoing conversations. So imagine my machine calling up that machine uh, on some Amazon machine over here on this port, on port 443, uh, port which you will become familiar with. <clears throat> calling it up on the uh, internet telephone and having a conversation with it about probably advertising spam, basically. 
and other crap. Uh, these ones are going away. That's usually what they mean. They're, they'll be gone soon. Uh, and Or not. And, uh, and, and some other stuff. Anyways. Uh, I, I forgot. Wrong operating system. Uh, all right. I was talking about listening, right? Um, is that what I wanted to do? Yeah. All right. So I was talking about listening, right? And I said that YouTube was listening as, uh, as well. Actually, no. The other thing I wanted to do was this. Remember then that list that we were just looking at? <clears throat> Some of these said established, right? Don't worry about the ones that said listening yet. See the ones that say established? Uh, and these other ones that say established? And I said that represents an ongoing conversation that's currently in progress, kind of. I network people are yelling at me because they're like, HTTP is stateless. Yeah, I know. But, you know, for the kids, like, don't confuse them yet. Um, so, <laughs> these are established. What does that mean? Like, as I said, these are TCP packets going back and forth, right? So, like, how does netstat, this command that I ran to produce this output, how does it know that this is established, right? Well, it's interesting you should ask that. Let's get back to the TCP uh, datagram header. Um, so, and again, which I know you're probably at this point, you're like 70% done tattooing it on the inside of your arm uh, or eyelids or wherever is most convenient for you to memorize it. As I said before, eventually you will need to be able to walk up to any random whiteboard and reproduce this diagram from memory. Okay. That's how well you have to know it. Um, uh, and anyways, uh, so these other ones right here are kind of weird. Uh, let me draw your attention to this one, two, three, gloss over the rest of this stuff, right? Remember I told you there's going to be stuff that, you know, you just pass over for the moment. Don't worry about this. Don't worry about this. You understand how source and destination ports work already. See, we went through that. So you know how source and destination port fields work in a TCP uh, header. Don't worry about these other numbers. They're a little more complicated. Uh, don't worry about this. Don't worry about this. Don't worry about this. Don't worry about any of the rest of this crap yet. All right. Maybe this. But um, I want to draw your attention to these fields over here, right? Um, specifically, these first two to the left right here, that, yes, what you are seeing is a 1-bit a field. And it's just that it, it was kind of, they needed several rows to do it. It doesn't mean there are more bits here. This is just the, you know, shortcoming of the diagram. So this represents 1-bit, which you might call the CWR bit, right? And uh, I'm not going to talk about these, about these two. So here are two bits I'm going to skip over. We're not talking about these yet, right? But I do want to draw attention to these bits, okay? Uh, these bits, in order, are urgent acknowledgement, push, reset, sin, and fin, okay? Um, these ones are important uh, right here. So each one of these fields, oops, each one of these fields is one bit. This is the urgent bit. We would refer, refer to this as the urgent bit, get it? So urgent acknowledgement, this is the acknowledgement bit, the push bit, the reset bit, the sin bit, and the fin bit. And as, I, as we noted before, these, I mean, these are not 16-bit fields like the destination port. These are one-bit fields. So they can only have one of two values. They either have zero or they have one. It's a bit. It's on or it's off, right? Urgent, so these ones again, urgent acknowledgement, push, reset, sin, and fin. These are very important. Did you um, uh, note when we were saying, are any of these, do any of these say sin? Sometimes they do. No. All right. Anyways, uh, sometimes some of them will be in a sin state if like the uh, server side did not finish answering. A long story. Anyways, the, um, when a, when a, a transmission, when a TCP packet, I, should, I introduced a new term, but when a TPC conversation is a, a, a fragment of piece of the conversation is marked as established, that means that a, the acknowledgement and the SYN packets are both on, right? So that is literally like the definition of an established, uh, well, actually that, and there's also an, est is there an established in the, in the IP header? You know what? Actually, I might have uh, we might not be ready for that discussion yet. <laughs> Actually, I just realized Netstat is probably reading the IP header uh, to infer that. 
um, what would be another way to do this? You know, actually, all right, this is what they call a TCP three-way handshake. Uh, in the beginning of the conversation between my machine and YouTube, uh, this is how the conversation begins initially, right? Um, my machine sends a packet, a TCP packet to youtube.com at, get rid of the spam here. Okay. My machine over here, right? The TCP client. Uh, so you should be getting used to this terminology. Remember I referred to all of this as a client server model. Um, <clears throat> A term which nobody, uh, nobody under like 40 probably has ever heard before, but that is actually what's happening out here, people. This is how this stuff was designed. So my TCP client sends a, a uh, TCP packet following these conventions, sends a TCP packet to the TCP servers called a SYN packet, right? And then the server sends back a packet called a SYN ACK packet. And then my client sends a packet called to the to the server called a, a, an ACK packet. What the heck does any of this crap mean, anyways, right? So, um, so this first packet that we're talking about that's sent by the TCP client. See how it says SYN right here. This is a SYN packet. What the heck is a SYN packet? Well, it's one of the fields in the TCP header. See, it's right here. Remember, I told you urgent acknowledgement push reset SYN and FIN. So this SYN bit in the TCP header. When this is set to one and all the other ones are set to zero, uh, pretty much, yeah, that's kind of how it's gonna be. So this will be zero, this will be zero, this will be zero, this will be zero, this will be one, and this will be zero. Literally, if you could see this packet, like visually in, you know, in the console, that is what it would look like. It would be, it would be zero, 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 one for the sin packet, and then zero, right? That is what a SYN packet is, right? So, I mean, like a lot of people, trust me, you go to an interview, especially an entry-level interview with a, some tech recruiter or something, they're probably going to ask you a clearance question about the three-way handshake. 99% of the people answering this question could not even tell you what, what makes these packets SYN packets, okay? And what makes them SYN ACK packets. What do you think make, makes a SYN ACK packet anyways? I'll give you a moment to guess. Guess what it is. Guess what it is? Urgent acknowledgement, push, reset, sin, and fin, right? What do you think a sin ACK packet is? Right. That means the sin packet is on, <clears throat> the sin bit is, is on, so it's a one, and the ACK bit is one, so it's an on. So now these bits in order are zero, so not urgent, one, so yes, ACK, zero, not push, zero, not reset, uh, one for sin and zero for fin, right? So again, that's going to be zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero. That's going to be the value. If literally, if you were able to inspect this packet, which you can with something uh, called uh, like TCP dump or Wireshark or something like that, uh, um, that's for way later. But if you, if you examine that, that is the, the sequence of bits that you will find on a SYN ACK packet, okay? You will find, what did we just say? Zero, uh, one, zero, zero, one, zero. That's what will make a SYN ACK, ACK packet. That's how your TCP client knows that it's a SYN ACK packet. That's how the server puts it together. Um, if you, maybe there may be a scenario in which you have an opportunity to modify this packet, right? And you wish to make it appear that it is a SYN ACK packet, but it's only a SYN packet. What would you do? You would find a way to flip this bit onto, uh, to flip it from zero to one. You get how this low level understanding is really, in my opinion, what, what makes hackers different from other nerds, <laughs> okay? No offense, I mean, we all love nerds, nerds are great. But a lot of nerds will tell you what this three-way handshake is, but they can't tell you why or how, okay? So uh, when I interview people, uh, one common question, it's not an uncommon question, to ask someone something like, uh, what are the uh, total range? What is the maximum range of TCP ports? You know, and my, they might tell you, well, it's, uh, it's, they might even tell you, right? They, like, they might guess, they might say 1,000, which would be a weird number, 
right? But like, I don't know, a million, unlimited? You get stupid answers. Those are all stupid answers. A valid answer is 65,535. That's the total range. I mean, the, the number of them, the counting of them, since you can't zero, is 65,536. That's the correct answer, okay? But if you follow up and you ask, which I will, okay, and discerning uh, people, which the cybersecurity people are probably the most discerning uh, technical people I've probably ever met, besides for like maybe operating system programmers. <laughs> They're extremely discerning, okay? And knowing the answer is not really enough. You need to know why the answer, okay? And if you follow up and ask them why it is that number, they can't tell you. And that is important to understand these things. <clears throat> wow, that whole thing, I think all I've done is TCP so far. And I was gonna show you connecting from, <clears throat> you know, we'll handle that. I'm going to take a, a brief, a break uh, for like maybe just five minutes so I can get some more iced coffee and then I will actually show you this in not the three-way handshake but we'll show you some basic TCP connectivity so that uh, you kind of cement this knowledge uh, for the moment you know uh, as an exercise to the reader go look up uh, RFC 9293 and find this diagram oh you don't have to because it's totally tattooed uh, on your forearm by now right uh, and have this diagram tattooed uh, everywhere. Go and look that up and figure out what an ACK packet uh, would look like. Uh, these mysterious ACK packets that people will talk about in interviews and yet not even really understand what they are talking about or why things are this way. Uh, okay, so that's me. I am going to be right back. Okay, I'm back. <clears throat> uh, HTTP response splitting. Look that up. That's hella fun. Uh, this is a very interesting topic. If you want to start diving into the deep end, and um, kind of, I think it really the reason I, I mentioned it just now is because it kind of relates to uh, I was looking for someone that had a better a better dissertation on this, and it's Port Swigger. So uh, go to Port Swigger. Uh, actually, we'll cover that when we get into the learning resources stuff. But uh, do go to Port Swigger and learn everything there. They have this thing called Port Swigger Labs. There's a lot of really cool little interactive exercises that you can work with. As you can see, I've done uh, half of them, uh, which is nothing to uh, laugh at. Some of them are quite complex. Um, so uh, this is a uh, fun stuff. HTTP response splitting, I mentioned it specifically because it kind of relates to why you should understand how these protocols work at a low level. HTTP response splitting is a, a design flaw, actually. It's kind of a design flaw in HTTP. As I said before, like, you know, if you, if you read through this thing, it will explain how things are supposed to work, right? And if you read between the lines, sometimes you will be thinking, like, is there something they you might start thinking, is there something they left out, right? And sometimes there is. Uh, for instance, uh, I, I mean, just like as, as an example might be like, you know, if your uh, your spouse or somebody is going to, your partner's going to the store to, uh, to get ingredients for a barbecue and, you know, you read their list and you're, you're thinking, okay, like you can look at the list and go, okay, yeah, there's 12 items on this list. What might be left out? That's what I'm saying. You can read these technical documentation uh, with a view to that, like what might have been overlooked on this list? Should mustard be on this list? Should uh, like checking that both sides of a proxied connection uh, are agreeing on the same way of handling HTTP responses? Should that be on this list? Should that be in RFC 2616? <laughs> um, so anyways, HTTP response splitting is a, is a situation that occurs because systems have not agreed on how to interpret a technical, uh, some technical guidance basically. And uh, 30 years later, lo and behold, there is a mishmash of systems uh, around the world that handle it different ways and that can be leveraged to a hacker's advantage. Uh, so, all right, uh, did you finish your tattoo? Good, uh, you're going to need that, all right. Let's do some lab lab stuff here. Uh, oh God, I keep thinking 
I keep thinking that's a Linux prompt and it's Windows. Um, all right. Not really a lot of stuff, but and further down the list, maybe I should have put this higher up. Further down the list, I'm going to talk about WSL and Linux. Uh, you know, like in short, you know, if you want to get started on the Linux stuff, which you need to, you will always need to. Uh, you know, I don't even care. I don't even care if it's actually a functional value anymore, which it is still, and it will be for many decades. But if it weren't, I would still say you had to. Uh, because it is part of the it's part of the rite of passage. Okay, this is part of the culture. <laughs> you need to live and love Linux and all of that. So, um, anyways, um, so you can go to the, if you're running Windows, uh, just go to the Windows Store and look for WSL, WSL uh, Windows Subsystem for Linux. I'm saying WSL in case my uh, enunciation is bad. Um, so go look for that and you can download it right from the Windows Store. Do not download it from anywhere else, obviously. And you'll be able to run a tiny Linux on your uh, system without getting involved in, uh, you know, like virtual machines, which are like virtual box, which could be a kind of pain in the butt and also system intensive. Anyways, go look up WSL and get that. That should be good enough for you for now. Eventually you'll get a, a junker box somewhere and, uh, and do a proper Linux install someday. For the moment, WSL will do the trick. So we were talking about low-level clients, right? I used Telnet before to get uh, YouTube.com on port 80, right? And rudely requested their front page in a, <clears throat> and received it in a, in a format of which we cannot parse, uh, which is fine. And, I, and at that time, <clears throat> at that time I referred to Telnet as a low-level uh, air quotes, low-level TCP client. Uh, there's another TCP, low-level TCP client, uh, which is very favored in Linux land. It's called NC. I briefly spoke about it. Uh, it stands for, what the hell does it stand for? Netcat. Um, all right, here's the man page for it. By the way, in Linux, that's how you read the documentation for something. Um, so this is the man page for Netcat. This is where it explains to you uh, all the stuff that it, it does. Uh, and it makes arbitrary TCP, and I'm going to skip this other word. It makes arbitrary TCP connections and also listens for stuff, right? Remember before when I was uh, showing you, uh, we'll do that netstat thing again, right? And this is in Windows over here, but you can do this in Linux too. Now, I'm just going to show the, lis the listening connections, right? Oops. Right, there we go. I'm just gonna show the listening connections. So those are where my machine is like YouTube, listening and waiting to uh, receive a internet phone call, let's call it, uh, on, on those ports, right? You'll note my machine is not listening on any of those port 80 machines. In fact, this is a standard collection, connection of ports that you will recognize on Windows machines. Um, <clears throat> Uh, however, we did see that there was a connection to, there were connections to various, uh, oops, um, that there were connections established to various other services, right? Uh, like up here, lots of stuff. This 52 address was Amazon, we, established, we determined that. So uh, these are established, and I said I was going to tell you what exactly that meant. Well, Netcat provides us with the ability to manipulate these sockets at a, these uh, TCP connections at a at a low level, right? So just to establish the baseline, we can uh, we can use it to uh, do the same thing that Telnet was doing to connect to TCP port 80, right? And uh, and do that thing, right? So I just retrieved to the front page of YouTube.com using Netcat, the, a very inefficient manner of doing so, and obviously clearly not what Tim Berners Lee had in mind, uh, but uh, this actually is what's happening with your web browser. Your web browser is doing that very same thing. I know, you're thinking maybe it's doing something else, something magic, something we can't see. No, it's not. It is literally doing that very same thing, the same thing that I just did. It's just doing it, you know, like with much more panache, right? <laughs> and instead of it just spitting the contents out at me, it renders it into fonts and cascading style sheets and JavaScript ads and all that other kind of crap, right? So it, it just is a much more elegant uh, TCP client, right? It, that is specifically focused on, on HTTP. Uh, 
it's a little more complicated than that, but you guys know by now that when I when I use that tone of voice, I'm, I'm glossing over things a little bit. All right, so that's what Netcat does. I've just established that is a, what the hell, where'd where it go? Uh, all right, so I just established that it is a low level TCP client on par with Telnet or whatever, and arguably maybe just the world's cheapest poor man's web browser. Uh, but it's really the poor man's TCP client. Um, it can also, by the way, it can also listen. Um, can I do this? I, mean, I can probably do that. Uh, so it can also listen, and it can listen on port 80, uh, just like, okay. and it can listen on port 80, just like uh, I was, uh, just like YouTube was listening on, on port 80, remember, uh, when we connected to it. So when I, I keep making, mixing up my operating systems. Uh, so when we were looking at those sockets before, right, I, I told you it was waiting for the for connections where it says listening, right, where it says listening. So it's listening for a connection. And we noted it wasn't listening on port 80, but look, now it is listening on port 80, right? Like, why is it listening on port 80? Because I'm using Netcat, the low-level TCP client right now, to listen on port 80. It's it's not saying much. It's This is, Netcat is not very verbose, right? So, it, but it is doing the thing that I told it to do. Now, I just told it to stop doing that. And if we do this list again, uh, you, we will find that it is no longer listening on port 80, right? Now, so so that we don't have to look at this list, that huge list every time, I'm, I'm actually gonna filter that using the find stir command uh, to just show us uh, listening, uh, Right. listening or uh, established, right. Now it's only going to show us listening or established socket. So I actually they didn't have a lot. There's still a lot. Let's just look at listening for now. All right, at least that's a little bit less to look at. <clears throat> so we see that it is no longer listening on port 80. I'm going to do that exercise again, just to establish that that's definitely what's happening, right? Uh, actually, there might be a verbose flag. Yeah, I forgot about verbose. I, I, all I did was I told it to give more diagnostic information about what's happening. So it said it's listening and it's listening on 80, right? Like we said, and we'll rerun that command and we'll see that my machine is listening on 80. All of that to establish that yes, Netcat can indeed listen on port 80, just like YouTube. Um, so let me leave that open for, actually first let me back up. Uh, let's set up this listener again, okay? <clears throat> Pardon me. And I already established uh, that Netcat is a uh, is it can behave as a low-level TCP client, and we have used it to talk to YouTube.com, right? So now, <clears throat> pardon me. Now we are going to use Netcat uh, to connect to my own machine. This is a little bit of a problem. You know, one of the ways to refer to your own machine is with the word localhost, right? Um, I'm, and I'm going to say connect to it on port 80. So you already saw me connect to youtube.com this way, right? I, I just said connect to youtube.com and I said on port 80. But instead of youtube.com, we're going to connect to localhost. Localhost is a, I'm using air quotes here, localhost is a magic phrase that stands for this machine right here. So I said, connect to yourself. It's like saying, connect to yourself on port 80. There's another way to do it, but I don't want to confuse you about numbers yet. So uh, so that's all this says. It says, connect to, uh, I should make this font bigger. Shall I not? Yeah, all these fonts should be huge. Why would they not be huge? Okay, so I'm saying, connect to yourself on port 80, right? I know, sorry, right. Let me get this straight over here. So over here, we are listening on port 80, and over here, we're gonna to say to connect on port 80, right? And yes, you can do that. I'm using, I have two different prompts open, so I'm running these command, commands at different windows. So I pressed enter, and now look, it says it has connected, it has received a connection from localhost, and there's a really interesting number here too, which we will get to later, right? 
So now this window has connected to this window on port 80, as I said. And let's take a look at the uh, listening connections, right? So we see that it is listening on 80. Um, but let's see, take a look at the uh, established connect connections, right? And we will find that there is a connection between this machine and itself. Where is it? Where is that connection? I could look for colon 80, but I'm afraid that uh, that'll get filtered out somehow. I'll just look for 80. I'm gonna end up finding a bunch of other stuff that says 80. Ah, here, oh, listening, it should be established. why it is not represented here in a way that I can show you. Um, it might be like in a time weight state or something like that. That's an interesting anomaly. All right, so let's say this left hand, I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch these around. The left hand side is the client side and the right hand side is the server side. Let's say this right hand side is youtube.com, right? And so it's receiving a connection from my low-level TCP client, we'll start this over again, uh, right, on port 80. Uh, why did that happen? Oh, right, right, right. I won't get into that, but it shut it down. All right, so now it's listening on port 80, and I'm gonna connect to port 80, right? And we're connected, right? And it says connection received. So it was listening, and now it's connected, and now we're over here, and we're talking to the other window on port 80, just like we were talking to youtube.com, right? And let's say I did this, which is a really rude way of just asking for the front page and I press enter. What do they see over on youtube.com? They see what I just typed in. So if I were youtube.com, I would answer with this. And this is literally what is happening, okay? I know this seems like an oversimplification. This really is what uh, is happening on the internet. You're watching like the world's most, oops, I forgot. There's a little bit of a typo in there. There it is. It's not a typo, it's a thinko. All right. This is what YouTube sends back. I know, it sounds like I'm making this up. You're like, yeah, that's crazy. No, this is literally how the internet works. This is what's happening when your browser talks to. And over here, uh, we receive this and we display it in a not elegant manner. Okay, if, we, if, this, if Netcat was Chrome, it would display Hi, mom, right? Just exactly like this says, hi, mom. And uh, so anyways, that's what, that's what TCP is doing. TCP is connecting your client. In this case, it's Netcat. Sometimes it's Telnet. Sometimes it's a web browser, right? It's connecting your client to the server. In this case, it's localhost. Sometimes it's YouTube. Sometimes it's Google. Uh, and it's connecting it on port 80 or 443 or some other weird ports that are happening, okay? And H HTTP is specifically uh, to transfer this type of data. It's intended to, to do this work, although at this point it has been extended to the point where it's doing just all kinds of crazy stuff. But originally it was intended to for this model that we just demonstrated, where a TCP client connects to a TCP server. It requests content in this format, literally in this format, and that the server responds a, with HTML format. That was the original design, and that's what you'll read in RSC 2616. Um, things have gotten a lot more complicated. A lot of things are bolted on top of it, but don't let anybody uh, convince you that that's not how it, actually, uh, how it actually still works. That's what's really going on underneath. Even all the fancy, the SSL, and all the other fancy negotiation and things that have been tacked on uh, XML and Ajax and all of that is all happening by this same means. And I'll tell you a, another little thing. Uh, email happens under that same, that same mechanism, as do many other of these, these core systems. All were designed 
using this basic model where a server is listening on TCP on some sort of port, like say port 25 for email and a, and a TCP and a TCP client and a TCP client uh, will talk to that and it will ask for, it'll say like mail to Gary at, um, you know, farmers.com. It's weird I typed that. It has not been my email address since 2005. Uh, anyways, it'll, that, that is how mail works. Like mail works very similarly to this. All the stuff works this way. Uh, it's just a lot of it has gotten really, 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 really complicated. But underneath, the funny thing is, underneath, if you just spy on the internet phone conversations between these systems, this is what you'll see, is this archaic uh, language uh, chatter between them uh, in really low level uh, formats that are defined by these RFCs. That was all just TCP. I didn't even get to IP addressing. Uh, God, actually, you know what? These are getting longer. Uh, as I, it, at this rate, well, it'll, it's gonna be like, uh, what's that, Z, Zeno's uh, paradox. I'm never gonna get to the end of this list because uh, I have to get through each item in the list to get I'll constantly going through the list. Just look up Zeno's Paradox. It's funny. All right. I think that's about as much as I can do uh, for tonight. I really was hoping, I'm thinking this is going to be like four episodes now. Maybe I'll just skip over IP addressing. You know what? You look up IP addressing, okay? You look up, uh, no, God. I can't just leave you to your own on CIDR. Go look up CIDR, C-I-D-R. You're going to have to learn that. That'll take you... A year or two okay and then go learn some like uh, bgp eigrp grp ospf go learn some routing protocols <laughs> and call me in the morning and we'll just continue from uh from item four that's as much as i can as i can do i think go read paco Gifo. i might have mentioned this before go read paco Gifo. it's good if you just like ah i'm like totally overwhelmed by all this technical stuff i need some way to you know relax and just chill out uh, you know, something, uh, something simple and, and, you know, like just, uh, pain, you know, pain free. They don't have to study. What? Oh, it's Alchemist Owl. They signed their own. I guess they signed their own cert. Um, that's fine. Uh, well, you know, go to, uh, go, go get, uh, it's called POC or get foe. That's big for, it stands for proof of concept or get the fuck out. Um, and, uh, it's, it's a great hacker zine. I like it. It's, um, actually it is usually extremely technical, but, um, but it, it's fun. It's a technical in a fun way. It's a way to take a break from, <clears throat> from the technical stuff without actually really taking a break from anything technical in a way. So, well, I hope that worked and I hope I wasn't like on the wrong screen the whole time. Um, like I was when I first started recording that and I hope anybody liked it. And uh, thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you on the next of many.